Hello, everyone, and welcome to Call Your Hits, a Storm Riders Airsoft podcast. Thanks for joining us, everyone. It's Chris and Phil today, and we are going to be talking a little bit about training. Training is something that we have done as a team for basically as long as the team has existed. Uh, I think for a lot of airsofters, there's uh, you know an appeal to going out there and doing like military style, real steel tr- esque training, mm-hmm. right? Um, when we started the Storm Riders, it was around the same time that the uh, Magpul like Art of the Dynamic Carabine uh, came out. And that was, you know, Chris Costas and um, what's the other guy's name? Travis Haley. Travis Haley. Uh, and they were showing a lot, like they were showing, showing normal shooters, regular shooters, all these kinds of drills. And I remember thinking like, wow, that's really cool. And that's really interesting. And I want to start incorporating that into our airsoft regular play. And I think for me, I didn't necessarily think about the training impact that it would have uh, it's just something that we're like, yeah, it's cool. It, you know, feels badass to do. So we're going to do it. We're going to have these training sessions where we'll go out and then I'll, sh- I'll, you know, yell threat and gun and all this kind of stuff. And we'll react and get training. And then slowly that evolved into our more sort of frequent training, which is more akin to, I would say, just a regular sports team practice, like practicing the fundamentals that you're going to take to to the game. But I thought today we'd talk about how training is is seen and done in airsoft and what are the different things that really do matter and um, how really like what kind of training effect you can expect to get out of it. And so it's no secret. I mean, we've talked a lot about uh, the fundamentals training that we do, which is like your ready up drills, your reload drills, your transition drills. That's for uh, my intents and purposes, I think is, is our bread and butter, right? Yeah, for sure. And I mean, yeah, we've we've had in the past uh, lots of scheduled training in in the last couple of years that really hasn't been going on the same with COVID and, yeah, and for sure. everything else. But I think as well, um, you know, a lot of times players can get to the point where, uh, like I've talked about before, it's like I don't do a whole lot of reload training. Most like I'm just going to keep familiar with it yeah. and then I'm going to work on other things. So I think a lot of us have have moved into the you know, training our personal skills on our on our own time sort of deal. Mm-hmm. But I think it's definitely a, a very important uh, topic because you can lose a lot of time and uh, spend a lot of uh, effort just going over things that aren't really going to help you. Like you said, I mean, it, it'll yeah. feel badass. It'll look cool. Uh, but most of the time, real steel drills that are based in any form of reality aren't really a great training tool for airsoft. For sure. And, and I do think that there's a lot of fundamentals, a lot of fundamental drills and stuff, uh, shooting fundamentals, I should say, that do transition to airsoft really well. And I think for us, ready up drills is a good example of that. Um, you know, we watched uh, Bob Keller and he was really praising the ready ups. And we're like, you know what? That makes a lot of sense because we, when, he, when we sort of did the math, the mental math on it, we're like, hang on, we do this a lot in airsoft. So getting better at that will absolutely pay dividends. On the flip side, um, learning how to stack up to a doorway to breach and clear a room is something we do basically never. So if we train it, like like you were just saying, like, yeah, you feel badass, yeah, it feels cool, but you're not really getting a skill that you're is going to translate and help you help you on the field, right? Yeah, it's like if you look at the, the most popular YouTube videos are like military training drills by military folks, law enforcement training drills where they're reacting to contact or they're they're being shot at, re- responding, that sort mm-hmm. of thing. Uh, then you're looking at like three gun competitions, that that sort of thing. And it's like, I'll say like 75% of that stuff does not translate at all. For sure. Right. Yeah. Does not translate at all. So, I mean, why would we even bother to, to train it? Right. I mean, mm-hmm. I think you need to, and it takes a while to be able to recognize what is going to work, but I think it, it starts with you sort of being a little nitpicky and, and having to think about how this stuff is going to translate. Like you just said, like you need to think about what are the things that are going to translate. So if you're a team, for example, that primary par- primarily plays like milsim games that are multi hours and stuff, does it make sense for you to train, you know, doing patrols with your team 
and reacting to contact and doing this kind of stuff? Like, yes, because in a Milsim setting where maybe it's multi-acre property, you will be doing those things. Yeah. Um, for us who play mostly at frontline, does it make sense to be training that? No, because when we go to frontline, that will never happen that we have to do a combat patrol and react to fire. We react to fire all the time and we start reacting to fire within the first five seconds of the game because people are shooting at us yeah. and it doesn't stop. If we were to go out with like Rob and his crew, uh, the, the Section 8 commandos on their like really large fields, they would have the skills that they need because they do a lot of that stuff and we wouldn't because we don't practice it because we don't really play on those fields. Yeah. Um, so if we wanted to get good to go play there, we would need to train it. And that's no different than uh, if you think about how modern militaries operate in law enforcement. Like if they have know they have this big dangerous mission that is coming up that is in an unfamiliar territory, they set up training and they train purposefully for this mission that they're going to go on. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, when you once you take the Call of Duty aspect out of it, and you 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 know you listen to actual soldiers talk about actual combat and that kind of stuff, I mean, it sort of it takes that veil of you know oh super cool whatever down to a much more realistic standard of you know what do you need to be able to do? You need to be able to get your rifle on target and put rounds on target, and mm-hmm. you need to be able to communicate, and you need to be able to move, and it's like. Okay, let's start with that then, because yeah. like you just said, I mean, if we do all this fancy patrol and all this kind of thing, that doesn't mean a roll of beans if neither one of us can shoot. Yeah. Right. Or it's like, you know, we can do all these fancy man- maneuvers, but when it comes time to, you know, engage in two or three guys or having to shoot and move and all this stuff, if that stuff doesn't work, none of it works. That's right. right? For sure. So you got to, to me, you've got to start with yourself. Yeah. Right. So ready up drills, getting comfortable with reloading, getting comfortable with, you know, switching your shoulders, all the kind of stuff we talk about in our videos. Uh, and there's there's more as well. Right. Yeah, of course. absolutely. I, I think, too. Um, and again, this this is if you think about sort of the, the military again, which is not to say, again, to draw this this parallel, but they have basic military training. And I think Cal talked about this in Canada. We have basic military qualification, BMQ. That means that you have everyone in, that you're engaging with, uh, when I mean engaging, I mean sort of working with, you can expect them to have, and Cal has said this, a certain standard, mm-hmm. right? And that's all this all this personal stuff that they have to know is stuff that they know, right? Because they've gone through this training. And so when they have the supplementary training, you know, you have this assumption that, yes, they know this stuff. And I'm not, I'm not going to sort of beleaguer the point because I'm a bit out of my depth when it comes to, to military stuff. But what I will say is with airsofters, because this is a hobby, we don't even have that baseline, right? We don't have that however many thousand rounds that soldiers spend through BMQ going on the range. We don't have the, you know, every single day PT to get in shape so that you can run and you can you can run 100 meters flat out and not be winded like that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, and you take it a step further. I mean, there's you go to the airsoft field and everybody's dressed up like special forces guys, right? Special mm-hmm. ops guys. Everything is, you know, high speed, low drag sort of deal. So if you really want to put it in perspective for those guys, like if they're doing, uh, you know, like special forces, they're doing a workup to go on a deployment. That could be nine, could be 15 months of training for that. Right. Mm-hmm. So like you said, I mean, you got guys who you're spending day in, day out with. Like we got to a point with a couple of us that we felt very, I'm talking about airsoft now. Yes. You know, we felt very, very comfortable playing with each other because we played at least once a week for like two or three summers straight. Right. And we yeah. got very good. So you can uh, you can very easily see when you get to that point how like spending like I said day in day out with people would bring that to the next level. Absolutely, I, I mean I'll add to that and say the the challenge for us is what you just mentioned, which is that realistically, like how often are you practicing and training, and what is the impact going to be? So yeah, you can get pretty comfortable with someone if you're playing you know every week, right? Maybe even it's for some people who play, they're able to play multiple times a week. You're going out there, you're practicing once or twice a week with with your team, you're playing once or twice with your team. That has a meaningful training impact. If you if I think about, you know, even like a recreational sports leagues, most teams will play games once a week and they'll tr- they'll practice with, as a team once a week. Mm-hmm. If you can do the same thing in the airsoft, you're going to mm-hmm. have a significant training impact. But if you're going to train with your team once a month, right? Or once every couple of months or you know, like it's been with COVID for us once in six months or even longer, um, you need to be making sure that that training is focused on the fundamental stuff, the big stuff, not 
the 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 really small scenario stuff. Now, doesn't mean you can't do it for fun, but if you have a, a you know three hour training session, two and a half hours of that have to be on the big stuff, and you can spend half an hour. And we've done that at some of our training sessions, joking around, doing all kinds of weird uh, uh, drills that are actually quite funny in retrospect. Mm-hmm. You're not we're not getting anything out of that but fun, which is fine because what we're doing is for a hobby. But if what you're looking for is training effect, you need to make sure you're spending the time like you're saying on the right stuff. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, if we just want to start like getting into that sort of stuff, Mm -hmm. like, like I said before, I mean, we really, you really need to start with the most basic of basic. It's like, can you shoot? Right. Yeah. Not shoot a real rifle, not shoot whatever. Can you shoot your airsoft gun? Yeah. Because the trajectory, you know, the handling, uh, the different, like 10 kilometers extra wind an hour is a big deal. Yeah. Right. Everything adds into that. So you need to be familiar with that. Then from there, I mean, if you can start to shoot, then you should be familiar with your kit, right? There should be no nothing hanging off you. You should be able to reload. You should be able to do what you need to do, change a battery, all this kind of stuff. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a big chunk right there, right? I mean, you can spend a lot of training just on that stuff. I mean, it's not it's not necessarily flashy or anything like that, but it's what's going to work. Absolutely. Right? And then then move into, you know, like barricade drills, like, you know, where you're, you're shooting from behind cover or, you know, movement drills or that kind of stuff. Because like you said, I mean, unless you are you are training with the same people doing the same things that directly translates to the airsoft field. What are you going to do when Jimmy doesn't show up? And now instead of, you know, your four man stack, you've got three like, oh, are you going to call off the day? Yeah, no, that's right. you need to be able to pivot. Right. So if everybody's to that level, then it makes it a lot easier yeah and another way of looking at it is to look at who look at the players that you're playing with on the airsoft field and pay attention to the things that they're doing and and asking yourself like is that something that i want to be better at than i am currently or than they are displaying right so if you see a guy for example behind cover and it's not that you it's not to say that you need to sort of malign or belittle anybody that's not at all what i'm going with going for but just be you know objectively if you see a guy behind a piece of cover and he's not using that piece of cover very well you can think to yourself i want to be good at using cover i can see that this guy's struggling it's a problem i never want to have that problem right that doesn't mean that you can't also help this guy if you know him or whatever or that you should laugh at him which is not at all the intent but you can make a note to say, you know, oh, I, this guy's caught up in his sling. I never want to be caught up in my sling. I'm going to train to make sure that that doesn't happen. And when you look at what it is that people struggle with the most on the airsoft field, it's getting caught up in their gear. It's not using their cover correctly. It's, you know, chicken winging when they're coming out of cover, not transitioning shoulders, all the stuff that when I'm shooting at people and I'm like, well, if he hadn't done that, I probably wouldn't have shot him. Right. Those are the things that I don't want to do. So those are the things that I need to train and make sure that when I'm spending, you know, an hour a week uh, just doing my drills at home, like I- I'm working on some of that thing, those yeah. things. Yeah, 100 percent. And like uh, I get hit a lot. Right. When we mm-hmm. go for an airsoft game, like I'm not afraid to get hit. There's a lot of times where I get hit probably more than other people. But I will guarantee you that it's when I get hit, it's I know that there's a good possibility I'm going to be hit. Mm-hmm. It's not from having my elbow out around a piece of cover or anything like that. Yeah. It's because all those things are taken care of. So now all I'm thinking about is like, if I can get to this cover, I'm going to be in a much better spot. Sure, I might get hit along the way, but hey, it's a game. That's what That's we're right. doing, it, right? Yeah. So I think when you when you can say that you can, you know, go through a game without getting those random hits, I mean, obviously you're, you're, you can be taken by surprise, you know, mm-hmm. all this kind of stuff. But that's a really good way, I think, to sort of uh, allow yourself to to grow up through the ranks as a, as a player is like sort of being aware of all this and trying to hammer away at those weaknesses and, and get that out of there. Yeah. And there's never going to be any particular skill that you outgrow, I think, is a very important thing. Uh, I've said before, I've said on the Discord, and I fu- fundamentally believe this, like I'm a lifelong learner. Like I will spend my entire life learning new things and trying to improve and get better at things. And I never, ever in my life have gotten to a point where I'm like, yeah, I, I, I know this. I never I never want to learn anything more about this. I never I will never grow. I am basically at the peak of this. There is no one better. That's never a thought that crosses my mind. There's always going to be something better. There's always going to be stuff that I can learn. And so consequently, even if I to, to, like, to your point, we were saying about reloads, I'm very comfortable with them. Does that mean I don't practice them anymore because I've achieved 
the the maximum reload mm. level. That's right. Like, no, that's not a thing. There is no level cap in real life, that's right. right? And that doesn't, like you said, that doesn't exist because all these skills are perishable. So mm-hmm. that's a very good point is that if you practice fancy stuff all the time, well, you better also practice your, you know, fundamental stuff because yeah. that fancy stuff is going to look really stupid when you can't perform one of the most basic things, right? Yeah, like a absolutely. reload or a transition or, or whatever the case may be. And, and I mean, uh, some guy uh, in the Discord commented on one of the videos, uh, the video that I showed of myself uh, when I was looking, doing criticism and stuff. Uh, and he said, yeah, you know what? Like, it looks like you got caught up in your two-point sling. And I was like, yeah, you're right, I did. And it's something that I need to practice more because I don't want to get caught up in my sling. But it happened. And I can tell you why it happened. Um, and that's not to excuse it and say it's okay that it happened, but rather I know why it happened. So now I can take steps to practice to make sure that it doesn't, right? Because I've got new pieces of kit that it's, you know, getting caught up on or whatever, Definitely. right? It doesn't matter how much experience you got with it, that something could catastrophically fail. Mm-hmm. And it matters about how you proceed after that, right? Like, did you get frustrated and fling your rifle into the into the trees? Not that time, no. No, right? But, <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, it's just like, okay, the rifle, you like get the sling off unclip it put it back on it's like no harm no foul yeah Good, that's right. right yeah and actually to be honest i never even thought of unclipping it but that's something i should i should be thinking about i had that problem when i used your rifle actually because your sling is a little bit tighter than mine mm-hmm. um and i got i got snagged i was trying to transition and i got snagged on on my gopro uh, and i never even thought to unclip it but that's that's a good point and i think as you as you're training and stuff you should be open to different ways and you know different uh, thinking about your training in different ways to make sure that you're covering off all the angles that could potentially happen or that you're approaching situations in the way that make the most sense right yeah yeah definitely the other thing is we uh, someone in the discord was also mentioning and i'm always bringing up the discord but guys like if you're listening to this and you're not on the discord i i, I cannot stress enough what a good community it is like what good conversations are actually going on there about airsoft about gear game modes teching and everything in between and just casual conversations too there are people in there from all around the world um, we have people in there from finland we have people there from the philippines from portugal uh from the united states from canada from the uk so i, I can't i can't stress it enough like if you're listening to this you should join the discord we would love to have you there but anyways someone on the discord was saying that they were asking if we include weird stuff in our training that could happen in the games for example uh you can't use your you can't use your left arm you can only use your right hand or um you partially fill your mags and you have to do like emergency reloads or uh, you can only shoot from kneeling positions and stuff and basically their point was saying well you need to add complications to your training because uh, if those complications happen, then you're all set. But if they don't, then you're even better than you were without them. And I thought that was an interesting point, and I, I thought we should talk about it, because I know that to draw a parallel, in running, for example, uh, people will train, uh, like I'm training right now, as in the heat as much as they can, because that way when they go and they run and it's not warm, then they have a bit of an advantage. And that makes sense in the context of that sport, but in the context of airsoft, I'm not sure you can draw the same parallel. Well, not with the heat, but with adding complications to your training. I think it's a very fine line, and I think it's very nuanced mm-hmm. of what you need to add complications to. So like uh, like we just said, I mean, uh, yeah, low cap in your mags during a drill, great way to add in more reloads, right? The only thing with that is that you know that, you know, you've low capped your mags. Yeah. So you're waiting for it, right? Which, I mean, it's really hard in training to get over that. Unless you are, you know, using a third party to blow a whistle or something like that. Even then, there's an anticipation. Yeah. But besides that, definitely there are there are times where uh, that will work, uh, both in game and in training. I think, like in training, uh, like you know, practicing different shooting positions, like from your knees, from your side, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, hundred percent. It's good. It's it's just like when we talked about. Um, uh, or whenever we talk about like high ready, low ready, all these kind of things is like, I think you should train them all because there's a situation that they're all going to fit better. And the same way with these shooting positions. Now, should we do it where we can only use our left or our right hand to simulate the loss of use of that hand? Well, I don't think so, because if we lose the loss or if we lose the feeling in our left hand, we're going to the hospital. It's airsoft. Right? <laughs> yeah. Like, is yeah. that valid for military and law enforcement? A hundred percent. Right. And yeah. we are not the ones to talk about that because we are not involved in military or law enforcement training. Yeah. But for airsoft, 
I think that, again, it can be fun. And maybe that's something that you do at the end of your training. But I think the majority of it should be focused on things that are actually going to translate as closely as possible. Yeah. And we've done we've done drills before where we did. Um, do you remember that that drill we did at the warehouse where it was like we were in the dark? Yes. Uh, and then we had like one guy rush at the other guy mm-hmm. and that person had to draw their pistol and shoot that person. But then we had the lights dark and like flashing strobes and stuff like that was yeah. hilarious. But that's not really doing anything like you're adding a lot of complications to your drawing your pistol and engaging um but it's not you're, you're not getting any training effect from that right no and sometimes i'll argue that that over complicating that is going to uh not necessarily re- well it will it will reduce the the effectiveness of it right i mean if if you have a drill that has an outrageously short reload time for somebody who maybe not is not the quickest reloader mm-hmm. perhaps they've got inconvenient pouches or they've got a a new setup or they're just not quick at it if you're giving them unrealistic times and you're rushing them and all this kind of stuff and that's the focus of the training then they're just going to get worse yeah right because it's going to be stressful it's going to be all this kind of stuff sloppy exactly so for for somebody like that i mean it's better to take it down a notch Mm -hmm. right and i think that again that's another one of the nuances of, of all this kind of stuff yeah right because again on the on the field uh, like, yeah, it's cool if you can do a really fast reload, but what happens if you mess that reload up and your mag falls out of your gun and now you're, you're stumbling. I mean, if you took, uh, that extra half a second of the guy next to you and you know, you got the mag in and now you're putting BBs on target, I think that's a lot more effective. Yeah, for right? sure. And I, I, I remember when we were looking at, uh, the old, uh, the mag pull videos and stuff, they were like, always keep your, you know, your eyes down range, bring your, your weapon up into your workspace, all this kind of stuff. Um, and people would say, okay, well, you know, you're not supposed to look at your mag. Don't look at your mag well and stuff. Uh, you're supposed to keep your eyes on the field and do it all in your peripheral, which is fine in theory. But like like you were just saying, if that causes you to screw up your reload, just look at your mag and your mag well for a second just to make sure everything meets. And that'll avoid you having to spend, that, you know, yeah, however long. That's, that's uh, I find that to be very silly because it's akin to driving a car. You're going to look in your rear view mirror. What are you going to do? Keep one eye in front and use one eye like a horse, like on the other side. <laughs> yeah. No, you're going to glance over, like get over it. Yeah, for <laughs> it sure. happens. The same as like if I'm running and I'm like, what am I supposed to do? Be looking at my target the entire time and I glance at my feet. Yeah. And all of a sudden I'm going to trip up and bust my teeth and break my rifle. Like, no, no come on. Same thing. Uh, people would say like, oh, you got to train to uh, draw your pistol without looking at your holster and look uh, and train putting your pistol back in the holster without looking at the holster right and like sure okay but like if i'm in a position where i'm drawing my pistol that's fine like i I should know where it is but when it's going back in like it shouldn't be a big rush like to take a second put it in so it doesn't fall off your belt or whatever like the the consequences of taking that extra second are uh the the consequences of not taking that extra second i should say are much worse than the impact of taking that extra second to just make sure everything is working the way it has to And then you get fast later on, right? Oh, 100%. Because, like, if you're realistically going to look at it, if you're going to say, you know, oh, you got to be this quick with a reload, you can't look at your uh, gear, you got to keep your rifle up, you got to be looking at target. Uh, Most of the time when I reload now, I'm in cover. Mm -hmm. So that's not even relevant, right? Why am I in cover? Because I I know enough now to say, you know what? I shouldn't be caught with a BBs in my rifle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a bad thing, right? Yeah, and I mean, is it going to happen that you're going to be in a position where you're out of cover and you have to do reload? Absolutely it will. Yeah. But we're not training for that 1%, I think is the bottom line. We're not training for that 1% event. We're training for that 95% of the time what is actually going to be useful, keep us in the game, uh, allow us to be as effective as we can be on the field. And, you know, that speed reload uh, in like a fraction of a second is not necessarily going to be it, right? It's like you were saying, most of the time we're going to be in cover. I'd rather be like 99.9999% confident at a time and then, you know, 95% confident at like what, a tenth of a second faster? Like, yeah. No. Yeah, exactly. Like, slow it down to make sure it's the same as if, you know, it, with especially with airsoft and a lot of times with real steel shooting, you, you know, you got a guy who's going to draw a pistol or shoot a rifle or do whatever. He does a super quick. Uh, it looks really good on camera. You never see the target. You never see like, you know, any shot placement. So how many times in airsoft have, have, you know, you come up to somebody and both you guys start shooting, but it's very obvious who's the better shot. 
right? Yeah. And that's all that matters at that point, right? Mm-hmm. So it's the same. It's akin to that to me a lot of times. Yeah, and I mean, you, um, we watched a video uh, not rec- not too long ago from uh, a guy in, in British Columbia that he sent in that we wanted to watch. Dude was super accurate with his shot placement, right? Does he need to be like... So he's taking shots really quick. He's taking shots very confidently. He's taking shots accurately. That's what you're looking for, right? Mm-hmm. Could he have been faster on some of those shots? I don't know, probably, does it matter? No, because he did exactly what he needed to every single time, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And that's and that's uh, you know uh, when you're looking at where to improve and how to get better, that's where you need to be. I mean, like you mentioned before, you know, uh, you got caught up on your sling, so you know that's something you got to work work mm-hmm. with. If you know the majority of the time you get hit during the day happens because of a certain thing, it's like oh, it's always when I'm reloading, or it's always when I'm leaving cover, or it's always when whatever. But maybe you should have a, a closer look at that and seeing what you can add in in your training or inquire about from other people. Like you mentioned, uh, you know, a great way to start if you're a new player and trying to figure out what to train or what to get better at is, you know, oh, it's like, hey, I noticed this guy is the, you know, uh, one of the last players to get out all the time. Like, what, what's what's he or she doing? You know, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. And that and obviously, I mean, not everybody that doesn't mean. Uh, a player that lasts the longest in the game doesn't necessarily mean that they're the best, but they definitely have good quality somewhere, right? Yeah, yeah. I you mean, know? unless they're just sitting around in the safe zone for the entire game. Exactly. Yeah. Like most of the time, you're right. Like the players who are surviving, you know, games, you should you can have conversations with them, or if you're playing with them, just observe what it is they're doing. I I think too there's there's this piece that people miss around airsoft training versus playing airsoft, and like playing airsoft is training right like if you if you play the game but you don't if you play like a weekend or you go to an event or whatever and you don't look at the training opportunities while you're playing you're leaving something on the table right yeah like every single game that we've played we have looked back and said like okay well what went well what didn't go well what did i do differently that game i know some games and we we've said this before but like we would take to the field with our rifle on our support side specifically to use that opportunity to train to shoot support side. Yeah. Right. Um, People can do like, it doesn't have to be something that you do separately either. Are you going to get hit more often if you take to this field with your rifle on the support side and you're not accustomed to it? I mean, yeah, probably, Probably, (laughs) but that's okay. Like you have to be, you know, you use that as a training opportunity, which when you're training, on your own at home or even with your team, you don't get to do force on force training. So you don't understand how you're going to react when someone starts shooting BBs at you. Definitely. Right. Yeah. And there, there comes a point with that where it's like, like a couple guys on our team, when they first like say like Johnny and Fong, they didn't want to, or they didn't never really explored shooting on their offhand side and they hated it. Mm-hmm. And then it was like after two or three games, when they got a little bit more comfortable with it, what'd you start hearing? holy shit, this is awesome. Yeah. I hit, I smoked all these dudes. They never even see me or it was like, I smoked this guy. I never would have before, like all this kind of stuff. Yeah. So give it a little bit of time for sure. Yeah. You can't just, you, you know, I, I've said this before, but like you're, you're going to start off and it's, you're going to suck at it. And that's, you have to be okay with that. Right. If you're yeah. not prepared to get hit more often as a result of trying something new, if you're not prepared to lose games as a result of trying something new, um, then you you don't have the right attitude, right? You need to be prepared and go in knowing that it's not necessarily going to go the way that you want it to, and that's okay. Like you, and it, it is humbling in in a way, especially if you are an experienced player. Maybe you've been playing airsoft for several years, and you think you're hot shit, right? You think you're like, wow, I'm really good at this, and you decide that you're going to commit to training, and you do something completely out of left field for you it's gonna feel like it's day one again and it's extremely humbling yeah uh, and you got to be prepared for that right definitely definitely and that's the only way that you're gonna figure out well you know what's better like what as you get more experience you're gonna have a better bullshit uh filter or even just a filter of what's gonna work for you mm-hmm. right i mean i like I ran a short rifle forever thinking that it was, you know, the bee's knees. And then I ran a long rifle every now and again when I needed to borrow one. And then there was a a period of like a couple of games in a row where I had a long rifle and I'm starting to make it work. And I was like, oh, maybe there's something more to this. Mm -hmm. Right. And I never would have thought about that. Right. Because I was convinced in my head, it's like short rifle way to go. Yeah. Right. So it pays to, you know, to try things and don't try too much at once. Yes. Yeah. Because that that's another important thing. It's like if you get a bunch of new kid at once, obviously you're going to want to use it. Cool. But like, don't 
if possible, it's like, don't change a bunch, a bunch of stuff with your rifle and a bunch of stuff with your kit all at once. Like, mm-hmm. introduce it slowly so you get, get used to it. I definitely fell down that trap this year when I ran a new GoPro mount on my helmet where the camera was upside down and closer to my field of vision. And I had the uh, the ear more, the ear protective stuff on, and I had a new chest rig on. I had all those things going on, and I felt like a complete soup sandwich on the yeah. first day. It's like, oh, I can't aim down my sight properly. I can't pick up my dot. My I can't go to offside because my it was just an absolute nightmare scenario. Uh, and it takes time to figure that out, right? And I think with like with your experience and whatnot, you know what's possible. You know where you should be. Mm-hmm. Like you know what your normal hundred percent like you know the feeling is. And that's why it's so important to have those levels and pay attention to that because you know, okay, so say you put on all your new gear and you're feeling like you're 60, 70%. If you're still feeling 60 or 70% after like two or three months, then you might need to, you know, look at going back to some stuff. But now if you're hitting, you know, uh, like arbitrarily 105, 110%, you're like, okay, all right, this This is is way better. This is way better. Right. So you've got to let, you got to be comfortable with that scale. And the only way to be comfortable with it is to, you know, use the whole range yeah and and to also to, to practice when you're yeah. in that situation and and do so and, and like we're saying you know the whole episode is about training and how are you going to train with this new pieces these new pieces of kit to make sure that you're getting everything that you can out of them right and in some cases you may train like you were just saying train and train and realize that you're not improving and it's because this particular piece of kit doesn't work for you at which point you have to be you know willing to move away which in my case you know in some cases i have in other cases i haven't um and you need to be focused on the right things so if you're if you're having trouble with your you know like i was shouldering your rifle on your offside with the ear uh, ear more on etc and then you go to a training day and you spend an hour doing room clearing you're not training the right stuff right no. so you need to be critical about how you're going to spend that time yeah for sure for sure if that's your goal is to get better mm-hmm. personally right individually yeah and you know if you're listening to our podcast if you if you've been paying attention to our content likely one of your goals is to improve personally right and that being said you need to think about how you're going to how you're going to get how you're going to train how you're going to get there right and having at least if you're not going to spend a lot of time like say an hour a week training that's fine but again coming back to those fundamentals like what are you going to spend your time on between game because every single minute that you spend i firmly believe this every single minute that you spend training Practicing the stuff that matters at airsoft, whether it's your ready ups, your reload drills, your offside shooting, whatever, is an ex- is one more minute than just about everybody else that's hitting the airsoft field. Definitely. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Most people will. I mean, your average airsofter. Not there's anything wrong with this, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, again, like this is not the point of of this conversation. Like for most people, it's going to throw their kit on the maybe the day before, probably the morning of. Yeah. Make sure everything's good to go, and then go out and then they're testing their kit. They're trying to get better with their kit on the field, mm-hmm. right? If you want to take it to the next level, you've got to allow, uh, you know, a couple times a week or once a week, whatever the case may be. And you've got to realistically put your stuff on. I mean, you can do a lot of drills around your house using just things around, try and replicate the situations you're going to be in and be critical, like you said, of, of what, what you're trying to do. Yeah. We did a video a few years ago about like at home drills and did you know, like you were saying, like there's nothing wrong if you don't want to do these. That's totally fine. This is a hobby. But if you want to improve, that's a really good place to start. Um, not necessarily our video. There's tons of content like that out there. But, you know, doing your ready up drills in your house is something you that you can do dry fire. You don't need to you don't need to fire any BBs. I do this all the time. I pick up my rifle. I do five on my strong side, five on my off side, and then I put it back on the shelf. And I'll do that a couple times, you know, throughout the day, maybe throughout the week. I'll do, a, you know, a few sessions like that. I might do 10 and 10. I might do 20 and 20, whatever. Yep. Right. Pick a light switch, pick, you know, something weird in my background and just aim at that. Chase your cat. Right. Whatever. Right. Yep. And you don't have to put any BBs down range. It's just acquire side picture, flick your safety off, pull the trigger, re- you know, f- do your follow through, put it back on safe and drop it back down and just do that over and over. Yep. And eventually it becomes so second nature that when you hit the field, you're not even thinking about that, yeah. which is where you're trying to go. Exactly. Right? Use your couch as a piece of cover and go prone, go on your knee from side to side, switch uh, shoulders with your rifle behind your couch, yep. move through your hallway, right? You know, moving, moving your rifle around this, this kind of thing. And I think, you know, uh, people do that all the time, just playing around. But but if you get serious about it and you, you know, you put the reps in, there's definitely a big translation. Yeah. And it's more not to feel, I mean, yeah, sure. It feels silly to be doing that around your house or whatever. You might be wearing your pajama pants with your with your plate carrier on or whatever. But 
just going through the motions, like you were saying, is super important. And a lot of the stuff that we are going to rep, we're going to have in our house is going to be replicated on the field in some way. Like you have left corners and you have right corners in your house. Like just use those those as doorways, right? Uh, you might not have a chest high wall in your house, but guess what? You can just kneel behind whatever. Yeah. Right. You can do your reloads and drop them on uh, like on a couch or you can drop them on a pillow or you can. So if you don't want them to, to hit the ground, make a lot of noise like those are all things you can do very simply at home. That does. There's no cost. There's no babies. You're not doing any damage to anything. Yeah. You look foolish. OK, fine. That's that's fine. Just get over it. Right. Mm-hmm. And just and get them done. That is really where just spending an hour doing that kind of stuff is going to have the kind of training impact that you're looking for. Definitely. And if you're looking for ideas of what to do, I mean, we've got a few videos for sure. Uh, we plan on coming out with some some more relevant new uh, new videos sometime in the future. Uh, but there are there are millions of hours of videos on YouTube from mm-hmm. all kinds of guys. I mean, I'm not even going to start to list people because there's so many. But just when you're looking for stuff to do for Airsoft, just like we said Try and cherry pick, try and pick what's going to be relevant and and applicable to your scenario. I mean, uh, we here, we do, uh, you know, a mix of skirmish games and as Phil likes to say, uh, Milsim light or Milsim adjacent. Yeah. Right. Uh, So if you're in an area where all you play is is like speedball, then not a whole lot of stuff is going to translate because that's not how people using real firearms in a real situation are going to move. Right? Yeah, absolutely. That's just not the case. And the same is like for us, you know, we can take maybe a little more, but again, not all of it by mm-hmm. any means. And you need to, it's very easy to fall down that rabbit hole and see what they're doing and be like, oh, it's really cool. And let's be honest, like it is cool. Like watching guys doing, like showing you how to clear a stovepipe in your AR or whatever. That's cool stuff. Like it's interesting to watch, but there is no, it doesn't translate to airsoft. That in particular obviously will not translate, no. but there's a lot of other drills that may seem tangentially like they translate but when you really think about whether or not this would happen on the airsoft field the answer is is going to be no just as a result of how our rifles work as a result of um j- just the, the the physics of airsoft and also the fact of the difference in lethality of, of real steel versus non-real steel you don't see any guys running a real steel ar with a lexan shield protector in front of their optic because if their optic gets shot there's a much bigger problem for them yeah. whereas for, so we're, we're solving for different things and it's important to understand where where it's going to differ yeah so if we're going to look at like okay stoppage drills and all that sort of thing long range shooting um a lot of tactics and a lot of like if you're doing uh like especially bigger formation movements all that stuff just forget about that stuff look for videos where they're going to show uh rifle mechanics mm-hmm. right where they're going to show uh, placement of things on like battle belts and, and play carriers. I mean, you can pick a lot from that sort of stuff. Yeah. Now, don't get me wrong. There's a huge difference between a play carrier somebody's going to use in a duty sense, which they might be, you know, they're living in for months at a time, you know, in, in a yep. military sort of case, and our play carriers that we throw on to, to play a game on Saturday. Totally. Yeah. Right. So, so be cognizant of that. But there's lots of lots of things out there. Like I said, in the movement, in the the kit setup. Um, in sort of individual tactics around barriers and that sort of thing. There's a ton of information. To take. And even like small, small group communication, right? Yeah. Oh, hundred percent. Like that's one of the aspects that's often the most challenging. Like how do you communicate clearly and effectively with people? And it's not cool guy stuff, but it is important. And, you know, you can see videos that teach a very simple concept, like just like your limit of advance and how you communicate that with people very succinctly to say, you know what, I'm LOA and they understand that to me. You can't advance. We need another avenue. Like there's a lot of ways that you can look at that. So yeah. tons of those videos are out there. And there's we've incorporated that a little bit into our training as well. And For sure. when we play, we use it all the time, which is also another form of training. Yeah, like we we uh, whenever we get a new person on the team or we we do have a team practice, I mean, we always have some form of bounding in there. Now, the bounding mo- uh, movement, we've done a video on it. The the bounding movement that we're using in training is going to be much faster. It's going to be much more linear mm-hmm. because that's not the point of the training, right? The training isn't to make it realistic in a sense that you need to be hidden, right? Because when we do it, when we do this practice in a warehouse, we're, we don't play airsoft in a warehouse. Yeah, right? we play on our fields that we know. The purpose of it is to get that uh, back and forth communication going and understand how that goes, right? Yeah. Uh, it's the same as every time you practice for a play, you don't need to do it in full costume, right? I mean, they're rehearsing their lines a lot until mm-hmm. they go to the full thing. Absolutely. Right? So if that parallel makes sense. <laughs> 
No, for, for sure. And you're you're absolutely right. Again, it comes down to what are you trying to get out of the training that you're doing? And is it that we're trying to mirror what we're going to do on the field when we move? No, it's we want to get that back and forth communication going. We want to get accustomed to what does Phil say when he moves? Does Phil say he moves as he's moving or does he say he's moving and wait for me to say yeah go ahead like just getting that kind of stuff out of the way yeah um building that familiarity with your other players and just building that common sort of understanding and baseline that you're all going to share right and i think it was in a recent video uh maybe the one uh, that you reviewed yourself um where you knew johnny was going to move and he didn't say anything right yeah. that's the same sort of thing so i think there needs to be uh levels in your head Uh, When you're doing this sort of stuff of like, obviously, Johnny's your bro, right? You're going to move with him very well. Now, what happens if that was a person there that you play with all the time when he's not on your team, right? To be a level down of familiarity. Then there's another level down from that probably that would be, you know, random, random player. Then there's another level down that's going to be brand new player. Yeah, for sure. And you need to, that's another thing that you need to work into your practice and work into, you know, your mindset when you're doing all this is, your, your levels, right? Like if I come up to a brand new player and I tell him to cover me, I'm probably going to spend an extra eight or 10 seconds and tell him exactly what I want. Totally. Right. I want you, when I move, I want you to put 10 or 10 to 20 BBs on this target here. Mm-hmm. I'm never going to say that to you. Yeah. Right? Unless it's something <laughs> yeah. very specific. Yeah. Right? So, so that's another aspect of all, all this kind of thing that, that you need to work into it. And when you're training, be, cognizant of that like if you're always training as a four-man team what happens when you go to a game where you're not on a four-man team yeah it's just a two of you are you going to be the army of four within your team you know because a lot of times that can be perceived a different way or people are going to have uh you know negative opinions of that yeah and rightly so in some cases yeah, and I know, I know what happens with us usually when we go is either we get split up on different sides, which is fine. Yeah. Uh, or if we're on the same side, we often will end up like pairing ourselves up, not with each other, but with other players who aren't part of our teams to make sure that we are spreading our knowledge as, as broadly as we can. Because to your point just now, if you're the army of four or whatever, you're off doing your special ops crazy you know secret squirrel bullshit over here but everyone else your main force they're just doing whatever right so either you get this disparity but by spreading the knowledge out you can make sure that everyone on the field is you know if only in this game progressing as evenly as possible right definitely definitely you're trying to to maximize the potential of everyone there Mm -hmm. and then maybe those people will start paying attention to that or maybe they're going to click in right away because they know right yeah and maybe they don't. Or maybe it's the first time player and you're leaving a really good impression with those guys. Right? For sure. And that all, again, wraps into the training. Because if we've trained together all the time and then we go do this on the field, we're not going to get a chance to play together. So what exactly are we training? Well, we're actually training, <clears throat> communicating, working um, in, as separate units with different people. right? And that's another part of the training that is relevant to our play experience. That if all we're doing is room clearing drills, we're not getting that, right? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So I think we sort of beleaguered the point a little bit, but the point is, guys, if you're going out there on your training, you need to make sure that you're training the right stuff, the stuff that is foundational to what you're going to be doing on the field. That's really going to help support and uplift you, your own personal skills. And if you're training with your with your teams and your buddies, what is going to support and uplift you as a group? Right. That doesn't mean you can't have fun training and you absolutely should have fun. This is a hobby. But if your purpose for training is to really get a training benefit and grow as players, then you need to make be making sure that unfortunately you're spending a lot of time on the stuff that is quote unquote less fun, um, but is going to really build your your sort of your your base, your fundamental yeah. base. Start really small and work your way up. Mm-hmm. And you don't have to train a lot. I know some people will go, but I do this for fun. Why would I go spend six hours? Like we're not talking about six hours. This isn't your job, right? But an hour a week or an hour every couple of weeks is plenty. Right. And like I said before, it's way more than the average people are doing. Now, if you have a small community like us, the advantage with that is it seems to me that there's a lot of players who are spending a lot of time learning these skills, which is great um, because I've said it before, the rising tide lifts all boats. They get better. We get better. Everyone gets better. If you play in a much larger community, chances are a lot of those players are not practicing and you will absolutely have an edge over them. There's no question. Yep. 100 percent agreed. Yeah. 
So guys, thank you so much for listening. Uh, we hope you found this episode interesting. Uh, I mentioned it in the episode, but if you would like to join on Discord, the link is in the description. We would love to have you part of our community. There was so much good stuff going on there. We'd love to share it with you. Please make sure to like and subscribe. Leave a comment as well. It really does help us out a lot. And we will talk to you next week. Thanks, guys.